give a warm welcome to Dr. Michio Taku. Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, these accolades can backfire. Recently, New York Magazine said that I would be chosen as one of the 100 smartest people in New York City. So I thought, wow, what a great honor. But to be fair, in all honesty, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> and next year, I understand that Lady Gaga is going to push me off the list entirely. <laughs> Such is fame. Well, today I'm going to talk about the impact of high technology on society in the future, in the next 20 years, in fact. Now, prediction is very difficult and dangerous. Let me quote from that great philosopher of the Western world, Yogi Berra. <laughs> it was Yogi Berra who once said, quote, prediction is awfully hard to do, especially if it's about the future. <laughs> well, I'm a physicist. We can predict the evolution of the universe billions of years into the future. So let me quote now from that other great philosopher of the Western world, Woody Allen. It was Woody Allen who once said, quote, eternity is an awful long time, especially for the end. <laughs> well, I'm a physicist. We are the ones who invented the laser. We invented the transistor. We helped to assemble the computer and the internet. We wrote the World Wide Web. Along the way, we also invented television. We invented radio, radar, microwave devices, and as a byproduct, we helped to invent the space program. We created the GPS system and weather satellites, and we physicists love to make predictions. But we helped to assemble the internet. One physicist predicted that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. <laughs> well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet. Then 50% of the internet will be pornography. <laughs> Now, as I said, I had a chance to interview over 300 of the world's top scientists for BBC Television, the Discovery Channel, about the future. But you know, prediction is also dangerous. Let me tell you a story of what happened over 200 years ago in Paris, France, during the great French Revolution. One day, there were three gentlemen about to have their heads chopped off at the guillotine. There was a priest, a lawyer, and a theoretical physicist, just like me, about to have our heads chopped off. Well, they put the priest's head on the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words before we slice your head off? And he said, yes, yes. He said, God, God from above shall certainly set me free. Well, all eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and stopped right before he hit the neck of the priest. Well, the mob had never seen this before, and so the mob said, let him go, because today God has spoken. Now let's see about the lawyer. Yes, the lawyer. They put the lawyer's head on the chopping block, and they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yes, maybe the spirit of justice, yes, justice shall set me free. Well, all eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, and stopped right before he hit the neck of the lawyer. Well, this time the mob went crazy, dancing in the streets of Paris. People were saying, today, God has spoken. Justice and mercy have spoken. And now let's see about that theoretical physicist. Well, they put the physicist's head in the chopping block, and they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yeah, yeah, I got some last words. And he said, you know, I don't know too much about God and I know even less about the law. But I do know one thing. If you look up, you'll see that the rope is stuck on the pulley. <laughs> <laughs> and then he 
said, if you remove the rope, the blade should come down real good. <laughs> big mistake. Huge, big mistake. Well, the rope came down, the blade came down, and the poor physicist's head came down. And it just goes to show you that sometimes we physicists have to know when to keep our mouths shut. Nonetheless, let us talk about the future and the impact of science on technology. My last book was an, also a New York Times bestseller. In fact, they tell me that my books are the only time in world history that the, world, the word physics ever entered the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> anyway, in the book, Physics of the Impossible, I go a thousand years into the future, when we may have starships, teleportation, maybe even time machines. And I answer the question, what happens if you go backwards in time and meet your teenage mother before you're born, and she falls in love with you. Well, if your teenage mother falls in love with you before you're born, you're in deep doo-doo that happens. <laughs> but today, let me say a few things about wealth and society. You know, these are hard times. And some people say that we can't afford all this high technology stuff. It's too expensive. What do we get for it? What kind of bang for the buck do we get? Well, let me tell you something. I live in two worlds. In one world, I live in the world of string theory. That's what I do for a living. That's my day job. I work in the 11th dimension, a world of multiple universes. But I also live in a world where we have to pay taxes here on the planet Earth. And these are hard times. But let me tell you something. Science and technology is the engine of prosperity. That's where all this wealth comes from. I'll never forget a story. During the space age, people criticized President LBJ by saying that it costs too much money to build weather satellites. We don't need weather satellites. If you want to know what the weather is, just go outside and put your finger up. We don't need a billion dollar weather satellite program. Well, I still remember watching TV. That very day, the Tyros weather satellite, for the first time in history, was orbiting the Earth and photographed the world's first hurricane from outer space. And as a consequence, the alert went out. We could calculate where the impact site would be. We could calculate probable casualties, property damage. Immediately, the alert went out. And I'll never forget, LBJ that night, I was watching TV, that night, LBJ said, tonight, the space program has paid for itself. And he was right. And just last week, we had Hurricane Sandy. And a nor'easter that devastated the Northeast. Many of my friends in New York were without power for a whole week, a week without power. All their food rotting, all their equipment, their supplies, their clothing, their houses washed into the ocean. But supercomputers were able to give us advanced warning and could calculate within two hours, two hours a time of landfall. But nobody was on TV saying, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Supercomputers have paid for themselves. We have to have a voice. We have to tell the American people that the source of this fantastic wealth comes from science and technology. Let me tell you another story. In 1994, my machi our machine, the Super Collider, was up for grabs in the United States Congress. Our machine was going to put high energy physics into the map, into the future. But that very day in 1994, they took a vote. The super collider was canceled because we physicists had no voice. People were saying, do we really need this gigantic atom smasher? Well, now we have the Lauritatron Collider, a small cousin of the super collider now built in Geneva. It's getting all the acolytes. The Vatican of physics is no longer in the United States. It's in Geneva, Switzerland. And it's something that we have to take into consideration. We have to have a voice.